you. Okay. okay, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, in the midst of all the turmoils of today's world that may come upon us, help us not to lose sight of, your fa of the faith that you have given to us and to see your glory daily in our lives, regardless what type of well or pit we may be in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're in the book of Genesis. Uh, we got to the third section. We're on the book of Joseph. Hey, we finally made it this far. It's been a few weeks. Uh, last week, we started hearing about Joseph and his brothers. Uh, we got the little bit of the introductory note, and then we moved into the idea that the sibling rivalry got great. And they took the opportunity to throw... Uh, Joseph into, well, we're going to find out about that. The sibling rivalry just got great. We'll just put it, put it that way. Um, remember, Joseph had some dreams, and the dreams were that his brother and his father, he also added mother, would be bowing down to him. Okay, we discussed last week, what did that mean? What do you mean by a mother? Your mother is already with Christ in paradise? Yeah, interesting. But uh, that was last week, so um, you can go online and pick up that video. But let's continue on with uh, Genesis chapter 37. We're going to pick it up with verse 12. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to them, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with your flock, and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. Okay, so Joseph is now in a managerial type position. Okay, he's going to go check up on the brothers, and he's going to give a report back to dad. Okay, remember, he's not the oldest. He's nowhere near the oldest. He's near the bottom of the line, so to speak. Uh, not the youngest either, but uh, definitely the special one. So if you had siblings and you always thought in the back of your mind that your mom and dad loved your sibling more than you, well, that sibling is Joseph. But let's bring Luther into all of this. But since God himself is the author of these offices... There are no grounds at all for thinking that the worship of God is hindered by these matters. But they are the most excellent and most pleasing exercises of godliness toward God and men. For God wants the fetus to be born in the womb and to be suckled and kept warm by the earnest care of mothers, that it may be nourished and grow. And so he places milk in the breasts. If any if anyone nevertheless happens to have the gift of chastity so that he can do without domestic troubles, let him enjoy this gift. But it is one thing to be immune from certain burdens of this life and another thing to condemn the life itself as though it were profane and heathen. Okay, so Luther's going to say, wait a minute, there is an office here. And what he means by an office, he means that Yes, Joseph is being sent on behalf of his father. This isn't part of the sibling rivalry type thing. I'm better than you. He is actually representing his father. And just as there is a structure and a form, you could say chain of command. That's a good word to kind of use. Uh, Joseph is going. So while I kind of baited you with that sibling rivalry thing, Joseph is being sent as the ambassador, so to speak, representing his father. And this is important. We need this structure in our life. And without the structure, we have anarchy and chaos. God is a God of order, not a God of chaos. And so God establishes the government. He establishes the church. He establishes the family. Those three estates Luther brings up and says that structure is indeed uh, important. And a little bit of a follow-up. Can kids sometimes get into trouble? <laughs> a little bit. 
No, no, no. Kids always listen to their parents, even when they're young adult kids. Because Joseph is approximately, let's just say, 17. So the brothers are definitely in their 20s, if not a little bit older even. So Joseph is checking up and has full authority of the father. Keep that in mind. Because if I take a look at the fourth commandment, it's now been transferred to Joseph. Keep that in mind. Okay, so let's uh, move on from verse 15. And a man found him wandering in the fields. You kind of have to stop at this point and say, wait a minute. Joseph was sent to go find the brothers, and why is he wandering in the fields and not finding the brothers? <laughs> hmm. And the man asked him, what are you seeking? I'm seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. The man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. Hmm. They were not tending the flocks. Why well, not where they're supposed to be? <laughs> now, you, you could read a little bit into that and in saying that, hmm, were they being a little mischievous? Or maybe the grass just wasn't as green and lush and they're like well we got we're concerned for the flocks and the flocks are better off over here i don't know a few weeks ago i was flipping channels and i came across this exact scenario on on whatever channel i was watching it was the story and they had all the brothers sitting there and they say they're looking at each other and saying, you know dad's gonna send joseph out here to check up on us Let's go someplace else, so when he gets here, he doesn't find us. <laughs> they all laughed a little bit. Yeah, that's one interpretation. And putting the best construction on everything, I could say maybe the, the, the grass was a little bit lean there, and they're liking it, where's a place for better grass? So again, I don't want to read too much into this except for, hmm, but they we... they weren't in Shechem. Huh? They weren't in Shechem. They weren't oh. in Shechem, and... There wasn't a bar. No, there wasn't a bar around. You're right, John. I know what's on your mind. Okay. <laughs> but did they check in or send word back to Dad no. and saying, hey, the grass is kind of lean here. Any thoughts of where we should go next or we're going to head out this way? You know, if you're going to take off, are you going to let Mom and Dad know? Or are you I'm just going to take off? I think you're a little too Western in your interpretation. Okay. If you've been to that country and see, it's pretty arid. Uh -huh. And if you have a big flock, yep. you need to move around. Yep. Otherwise, you'll overgraze. Correct. So, and, right. you know, they don't have motorcycles or cars to go check in with Dad. They don't even have horse, horses. They may not even have camels to do that, right? Maybe donkeys. Maybe. So, I mean, they, they were experienced, older yep. people tending yep. the flock. Yep. It's, it's, I quite think it's possible. quite mm -hmm. legitimate to not read more into it than look things were not too good they moved on That's they it. moved on and there's nothing wrong with that either no i agree with you on that i agree with you it's just i also know there's another interesting verse that's going to come up uh it has to do with reuben uh and reuben apparently gets separated from the brothers and then comes back and so you're like there must have been some traveling but anyway you're right i don't want to read too much into that but let me bring uh, luther in for a moment here and this is a little bit of a lengthier quote so my apologies joseph sets out for his brothers with ready heart and when he has wandered for some time in the field he is shown the way by a certain man who meets him on the road but he does not know what great danger is threatening him and how very close to him destruction is. For he is not warned by anyone, and God per himself permits him to fall into the hands of his cruel brothers. He disregards both of them, the father of Jacob and the sons of Joseph, and pretends not to notice those things which the brothers were planning openly for a long time and allows the son to be sent by his father and to be cast headlong into destruction. Where now are those angels which were celebrating above because they fought for Jacob against Esau? No angels here to warn Jacob and say, take care not to send Joseph to the rest of your sons. They will kill him and you will be deprived of the sweetest delight of your heart. 
All the angels and God himself are silent. This is awesome, assuredly something remarkable and unheard of, which I am unable to fathom or express in words. For God permits the father of Jacob and his son to fall into very present destruction. Now, I will admit Luther has a very poetic way of sort of putting some things in there. The point that Luther is trying to make is, yeah, God knows all things, and God is going to be silent and is going to allow this evil to take place. And as Christians, how are, what's our reaction to this? Because some of you may know the rest of the story. Uh, he's going to be thrown into a pit, sold off into slavery. Okay, and the father is going to be devastated. Yep, is I fully agree. He's silent, but is he absent? I didn't say he was absent. You're right. You're, God is always with us. Right. But sometimes God does turn His back for a reason. So, what was your what was your epistle reading for today? You're right. You talk about the <clears throat> discipline from the Hebrews. The father disciplines the child, and sometimes. That's exactly where I want to go. And sometimes he allows things to happen for a reason. God does have a reason. But when bad things happen to us, are we willing to be patient? Luther is setting up that teaching for you and me. Okay, uh, Because very often when bad things happen, sometimes we get our feathers a little ruffled and we want to walk away. And Luther is reminding us, don't walk away. And the patriarchs are teaching us, because that is the beautiful lesson at the end, as Joseph himself will basically say, uh, that this is all for God's glory. Okay, you may have thought it for evil, but God will take the evil of this world and turn it to his good. Okay. You okay? I am. Yeah, okay. Okay, so let's, uh, one more uh, quote from Luther. Um Therefore, it is an example that belongs to our co uh, consolation and reminds us to remain, to remember that we are men and think nothing human foreign to us. For if such experiences befall the patriarchs who were full of the Holy Spirit, why are we surprised or why do we murmur when we suffer similar trials? Indeed, let us rejoice, rather rejoice and give thanks to God when we feel ourselves being tossed about by the same misfortunes with which God exercised the saintliness of men from the beginning. So again, Luther's teaching point for us is when misfortunes happen, God's still there. Okay, continue to put your faith and trust in God, no matter how bad it may seem around you. And for Joseph, it's going to get really, really bad. And then it's going to get worse. Uh, let's get to uh, verse 18. The brothers saw him from afar. And before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him. And we will see what will become of his dreams. Okay, look, first of all, let's just unpack for a moment their logic. We're going to kill Joseph, and now we will see what will become of their his dreams. Okay, so were they picturing the dreams were from God? No. Okay, they were picturing the, these dreams coming from Joseph. That these were his ideas. Okay. Okay. How many of you come up with your own dreams at night? Often. <laughs> I have my own ideas. I would call them daydreaming ideas. But at night, when I'm asleep, I have no control of my dreams. Okay. Uh, and, you know, if you had... Two repeated themes of dreams like this, and he was bold to speak about them. You know, I would probably sit back and say, okay, something like his father, something's going to be going on. Remember, his father was kind of rebuked him a little bit, but then pondered these things. We talked about that last week. 
<clears throat> the brothers did not. The, the jealousy, the sibling rivalry took over. They just assumed these were just Joseph's ideas. And if Joseph is gone, so are his ideas. Okay, fair enough. However, let's go on with a, a couple of quotes here from Luther. God is silent over, uh, over against the ungodly and bloody plans of these brothers. He does not disturb them or hinder them. He is blind and deaf. He, is neither, he neither sees nor hears nor feels, and yet he says, I will be your protector. So I grab that just to say, okay, what do you want to do with this? As Luther brings this up in case if you weren't thinking the same thing. Did not God promise to be with this family and that through this family, a savior would come? Okay. Oh, yeah, we, we know as Monday morning quarterback, so to speak, we know the savior does not come through the line of Joseph. However, is not God's protection there? So when bad things happen to us, do we sit there and say, God, you promised to protect me? Or are we sitting there going, okay, Lord, help me to understand what's going on? That's the challenge point for us as Christians. Let me continue on with Luther as he has a little bit of fun with all this. This is therefore the wisdom of the Christians to endure the plans of God and to persevere by faith in the promises that have been given. For it is indeed sure and firm. And the Lord's covenant is faithful according to the statement of Psalm chapter 121, verse 4. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. But human reason replies. Notice this is human reason re replies. These things are indeed excellently and beautifully spoken, but I am experiencing the contrary. He is not only sleeping, but even snoring, to be sure. There is plainly no God at, at all to care for us and have, and have regard for us. So notice Luther is bringing in our sinful human nature's reaction to this. And he's, again, he's being a little po poetic. Not only is God sleeping, he's even snoring, so to speak, deep sleep. And then comes to the conclusion that God doesn't care for us. So as Christians, we have to realize we're still struggling with our human sinful nature. We are going to have thoughts and ideas like this from time to time when things get really, really bad. And Luther names it for a reason, so that we can put down these thoughts and continue to trust in the promises of God. So let me continue on with that thought. Luther helps us out. Therefore, there is need of wisdom and doctrine exceeding, exceeding uh, the whole grasp of human reason by which I am able to say, I have been baptized. I've been absolved of, from my sins. I have eaten the body and drunk the blood of Christ. I have the most certain word of God. He will not lie or deceive me. However, much all things seem to be carried in a contrary direction. So notice where Luther is wanting you to put your confidence. In the word of God, baptism, Lord's Supper. That is where your confidence is as you continue to trust the promises of God, even though the world around you seems to be falling apart. So Luther is, this is the main teaching point he's trying to make. Trust in your baptism. I have been baptized. God's name's been placed upon you. I've been forgiven of my sins. I've eaten and, drink and drunk uh, the body and blood of Christ. We have that certain word of God. God is not going to abandon us no matter what we see in the world around us. And as Christians living in this time period, we need to continue to get that message out because it might get a little bit tougher for us as Christians, not necessarily easier by today's culture standards. But let's continue on. Verse 21. Don't mind me. I'm oh, sorry. Because yeah. that, that's a really key point. And it, mm -hmm. and it, for me personally, reading, you know, you can say all those words, mm -hmm. but it, it's through the troubled times that you, you get to the point where you're at rock bottom, where you either make the decision to trust God or your own strength. Right. And that's part of why trials are there. And as you'll go on, 
that was an integral part of what Joseph went through. I, I love how you said that's why trials are there, because you may not know this. Luther talks about three things that make a theologian. Three things that make a pastor, so to speak. Prayer, mm -hmm. meditation, focusing on God's word, and guess what? Trials and tribulations. Hey, hey yeah. Oh. Of course, they told me that after I entered seminary, not beforehand. You know, why don't they put that on the billboard to begin with? Come to Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, where we're going to teach you how to pray, we're going to teach you how to meditate, and we're going to make you suffer. <laughs> Thanks be to God. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Oh, Lord, have mercy. And it, and the suffering draws back the prayer and meditation. I, actually, this is a truism. I, I actually was speaking to uh, a small audience, and one of it had another pastor and uh, his secretary, and he was just asking me, you know, how things were going and so forth. You know, I was raised to two daughters through high school, young adulthood, and I'm like, yeah, through those two daughters, the Lord really taught me how to pray. Yes. <laughs> and how to return back to God's word for meditation, and as I've been going through all these trials of trying to raise two daughters uh, in uh, today's world, ah, uh, it's all good now that, no, not completely. <laughs> the Lord is good, amen. I'll just leave it that way. Yes, I think I saw a hand. Janet? Yeah, well, Aren't we tested? We can't be fair weather Christians and only believe in God when things are going good. Right. The time we should come closest to him is when things are in trial and tribulation and we should not blame God for what's going on in our lives. We should come closer. That, that's God. why you, you make the case, Janet, uh, of in our prayers. So you sit there and say, Lord... Um, Give me a weak faith. Don't try me. Don't test me. I want a real weak faith. Keep me right there on the edge. Uh, no, we usually don't pray that prayer, or we should not be. We should be saying, Lord, strengthen my faith. Okay, how is that faith strengthened? How are your muscles strengthened? Exercise. Exercise. We all love exercise, right? <laughs> so if I, I say, hey, let's convert the basement into a full gym. We're all going to go, yeah, I can't wait, Pastor. We'll all be there. Yeah, No, no, we're not going to do that. But anyway, yes, John. What prize on earth can you be so uh, enjoying that that uh, that you still don't worry about something else? Because we, we're, as you get older, you think, oh, that's wonderful, except you always think of that word, except that's what I'm getting. Temptations come at every age. It's not just the young people who endure temptation, but the middle-aged people and then also the older people. Satan never wants to give up on us. Thanks be to God, God doesn't give up on us either. Amen. And we know who's stronger, so we put our faith and trust in God. Okay, let me get back to Genesis here. Verse 21, But when Reuben heard it, referring to they wanted to kill Joseph, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand, to restore him to his father. Okay, Luther, I'm sorry, Reuben makes this connection here. Father, he was sent by the father. Okay and says we need to restore him back to the Father. What's interesting, I throw in this quote, sorry, from two chapters earlier from Reuben. I know it sounds a little bad, but let's deal with it. While Israel lived in the land, Reuben went and lay with uh, Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. And you're sitting there going, is this the same person that disrespected his father by having sex with his concubine? And now he's sitting there going, I need to respect the father and let's bring Joseph back to the father. There, there's an interesting struggle going on within Reuben here. Yes, Greg. How long ago was that? <laughs> <laughs> you missed that, huh? Uh, yeah. You can catch it on YouTube. I think that might be two classes ago. Okay. But yeah, you're just like, 
Well, wait a minute. That was when I, I flew through uh, chapter uh, th 36 because of my spiritual gift of assassinating names. So I didn't want to go through the names of uh, Esau and his generation. So we kind of flew through that very quickly. Okay, But yeah, it, it's there. And it's just a one-liner. That's all you hear of it. Plain and simple. And you're sitting there going, what was Reuben thinking? Okay. And again, you might be thinking, what is Reuben struggling with? Because at this point, I'll entertain the idea, and Luther also entertains it. He has an interesting way of describing it, is, was Reuben forgiven? Right. Is he struggling with this guilt? I screwed up. I made a huge mistake. And this is the difference between forgiveness and, you know, I made a mistake. I will atone for my mistake. Let me do something good for my father. Those are two different things. Now, I don't know exactly what was in the, these people's hearts. Scripture doesn't give it to us. But I will admit, Luther does have an opinion on this. <laughs> okay, so let's get to uh, Luther's uh, opinion on this. Rubens is innocent of his brother's blood, although this innocence does not free him from the incest which he previously committed. It seems, moreover, that he wanted to escape or mitigate this punishment with this deed to see if, it, if he might possibly insinuate himself into his father's favor again. But his father took no notice of his efforts and this humble attitude. Although he forgave Reuben's sin, the punishment remained, as is stated in the German proverb, old guilt does not rust. A debt, however, gets old, does not uh, contract rust. Okay, so what's Luther trying to say here? Okay, first of all, let's talk about the forgiveness that Christ has. And he dies on the cross, right? For only the sins of Missouri Synod Lutherans, right? <laughs> no. For the sins of the whole entire world. But does the whole entire world want that forgiveness? We wish they would want that forgiveness. But those who believe and trust in Jesus Christ, they want that forgiveness. Amen. They have it. It's already theirs. Others are trying various systems of working their own salvation, so to speak, by accomplishing good. You, you see that with, you know, the concept of karma, you know, especially. You know, if you do good, good will happen to you. If you do bad, bad will happen to you. The universe will kind of just correct itself bad theology. We need to talk about forgiveness of sins, okay? I cannot earn or merit my sins. There's nothing I can do to atone for my sins. I need a savior. I need a deliverer. I need a redeemer. It's not by my good works that my sins are forgiven. I need Christ, okay? And so Luther's of the idea that Reuben is still struggling around with this unresolved guilt, and he, he does articulate a little bit more, and not to go into <clears throat> pages and pages of Luther to articulate that. I just give you a little bit of a summary just to sit there and entertain that as a question. Forgiveness of sins is how guilt is removed, not good works. Okay, so we put the focus on Christ and the forgiveness he brings. So, yeah, go ahead, Ben. Did God put a limit on the number of sins you can make? Oh, your turn. The answer is no. no. Okay, go but on. There's, so I think we see from this, actually we do get a, a picture of where they are. If you, Genesis 49, where uh, Jacob is blessing and talking about each of his right, sons. Right, right. And Reuben is first. Yep. And he, he talks, you know, Reuben is the firstborn, and yet he loses the, the position of the firstborn because of what he did. So right. Whether or not he was forgiven by his father, the consequences of that mm -hmm. still remain. We, we talked about that previously, and I know you weren't here, but we, we set up the following uh, example was, uh, you know, um, and actually let me just do an interesting teaching point with this, because let's bring it back for a moment, because I don't think I actually taught this as well as I wanted to, is like in my office as pastor, okay, it is an office uh, that... You know, this congregation has called me into, and the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod said, hey, you've gone through seminary, uh, you've been approved by our faculty, you can hold this office, the congregation calls me. If I commit a particular sin, 
Okay, we have a zero tolerance policy for uh, uh, any uh, sexual mishap, so to speak. Uh, I'm immediately removed from this office. Am I still a Christian? The answer is yes, but I can no longer serve as pastor. The same thing kind of happened to Reuben. Uh, and we were talking about he, this was almost like this was his reasoning for as firstborn, he should have been the main guy, inheritor of all things, but he screwed up that office, okay? He's still a child and part of the family, but he's not that office bearer anymore, okay? And so, um, but now, again, the, the whole concept of guilt is a little bit of a different issue. So I can't serve in that office if I majorly screw up. But now uh, I have to worry about taking a, uh, taking a look at my sin and being forgiven through Christ and being restored through Christ. And so that's a little bit of a different issue. So you have the office and then you also have uh, the unresolved uh, guilt. But you're right, you did look a little bit of ahead and that's nothing wrong with that. We're going to get to that when we get to the blessings of the children and sort of unpack that a little bit more. But uh, you're right, Reuben lost that office. There is no man that can keep that promise because it's in thought, word, or deed that Correct. one sins. Correct. So there is absolutely nobody. Correct. Male or female. Uh huh. Who can uh, keep that vow 100% perfect, only through God's grace. And let me give you the Missouri Synod's look at that. Oh, no. <laughs> I know, I know, hang on to that. <laughs> And that is basically is if you abuse the office, you should not be an office bearer. And that's why the, the Missouri Synod kind of has that approach. But you are right. Have I broken the sixth commandment? I have broken the sixth commandment. We sin by thought, word, and deed. Amen. Uh, and it, it does uh, bring up a lot of interesting discussions, okay? Uh, especially uh, along the lines uh, sometimes pastors have and elders have discussion, because I had this in a previous parish where they're sitting there going, okay, what do you do with a couple living together before they're married? Okay. And to which I was saying, okay, let's have some fun with the discussion. I want you to sit there and say, you mean I'm going to ask every single bride and groom before they get married? You, you promise that you never have had any special thoughts, so to speak, toward your beloved that you want to get married, right? You never broke that in thought, word, or deed, right? Uh, and at that point, we had a very interesting discussion. Yes, we do sin by thought, word, and deed. Uh, we cannot keep the commandments perfectly. Thanks be to God, our Savior does. And so we put our faith and trust in what our Savior has done. Uh, and then we try to sit there and say, how do we handle this in the church? And again, what do you do with couples who are living together before marriage and some other questions? But for, for Reuben to sort of circle this back here, uh, you're right, he lost the office of firstborn. He's still in the family but not firstborn. But anyway, is he trying to atone for his sin? Quite possibly. Quite possibly. And that's or, what Luther is trying to bring up here. Or renegotiate. Or renegotiate. You're right. You're right. Okay. Or maybe just trying to do the right thing. Okay. Nothing wrong with that either. Fair enough. We really don't know. But Luther does want to bring in guilt is resolved by forgiveness, not by doing the right thing. That's the thing Luther wants to bring in. But let's continue on. Verse 23, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Hmm. Okay, so we're going to have a lot of fun, and we're going to do some interesting parallels, so just hang with me on this one and if we get lost please stop me and uh i'll try to backtrack here okay so i'm already forewarning you we're gonna get uh we're gonna have a little bit of fun so i'm gonna first start with luther for joseph is a figure of christ and his descent into hell is indicated in this passage or as zachariah says into the lake in which there is no water that by the blood of his testament he might set free those bound in the lake. 
<laughs> okay, so I put that passage in from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 11. Uh, also, uh, for you, uh, as for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waters list pit. Okay, so that's kind of what Luther has in the back of his mind. Okay, so first of all, Luther is going to come up with a statement, uh, we kind of talked about this earlier, that Joseph is a type. I like to use the word type, or a figure of Christ. Not that Joseph is God. No, 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 no. But the example that Joseph is going through is the same example of like what Christ is going to do. Uh, remember, this is Old Testament giving us a picture of Christ uh, even before uh, he is born in Bethlehem. So again, part of that idea here. The, all the scriptures, as Jesus says, point to Jesus. And so we can take this liberty, and, as Luther does, and say that Joseph is a figure, or I will say a type of Christ. And so now he's going to take a look at this descent into hell. Okay, We know it doesn't end here. Okay, uh, And for Christ, the descent into hell was part of his victory, Okay, not part of the suffering. So there is not 100% uh, parallel here, but an interesting um, picture uh, that Luther is going to equate here, that, that throwing, in, throwing uh, Joseph into the pit as compared to Christ being going into hell. What, what's fun about that in today's world, and you may not realize that, this is, I'm sorry, that the descent into hell is highly debated in a lot of churches in today's world. If you just started doing a canvassing of what uh, churches officially teach and ask, do they believe that Christ descended into hell between, say, Good Friday and Easter, a lot of them are going to say no. The descent into hell is greatly debated. Okay, uh, but Luther doesn't have that debate. Uh, he's he's going to make that picture there. Some other pictures from Joseph, again, kind of putting in the back of our mind a picture of Christ. So again, when you hear that he went into the pit, I do want your mind to think, oh yeah, and Christ descended into hell. Okay, uh, to proclaim himself victor, that is to set the prisoners free. Ooh, I will set your prisoners free. And we could go into a whole Bible study on the descent into hell. Uh, there's not that many Bible verses that talk about it, but here's one of those that kind of talks about the prisoners are being set free. That is the purpose and work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to free us from sin, death, and the devil. Amen. Yes, John. Is he talking about extreme pain? Where, where the, where the, it's, it's so extreme that even hell would... Would, would be a comparison to it. I mean, you pass out in extreme pain, I know. Okay, now when, when it gets to the pictures of hell, I will admit, uh, Dante in the, his book Inferno has filled us with lots of images. Uh, and Hollywood has also added to that. Uh, let's just say for Christ, uh, his suffering was over on the cross. So we talk about his steps of humiliation. And then we talk about his steps of exaltation. The descent into hell is really part of his exaltation. So was Christ suffering when he went into hell? The answer was no. Was Joseph suffering when he was in the pit? Mm -hmm. The only thing that you can pick up, let me just go back to this, is that the pit was empty and there was no water in it. And so it doesn't necessarily give you the image that he's there screaming and yelling in pain, but it also wasn't, uh, here's a couch for you to sit down while we figure out what to do with you, okay? But let me uh, go back to uh, this image here and say there's also another image of Christ within the this verse. Did anyone pick on pick up on it? Stripping the robe. The robe. Yeah, let's have fun with the robe. Uh, John chapter 19, verse 23, when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each sh uh, sh soldier, also his, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Okay, you know, they cast lots for it. Okay, so we got the tunic, we got the robe, and now let me bring in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. I will re greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me 
with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Okay, for us as the bride of Christ, what is this robe of righteousness? Mm. This garment of salvation. It's the blood that he shed for us. Yeah? And how does it get applied to us? Baptism. Huh? Baptism. Baptism. So we, we, I want you to immediately move to baptism. Some traditions in some Lutheran churches, not this one, would, wouldn't mind bringing this tradition in, put a white cloth over the infant after the infant has been baptized to remind uh, everyone about how Christ covers our sins with his white robe of righteousness. Okay, and again, where am I getting this from? Well, you get a hint of this from Isaiah. Oh, Old Testament? <laughs> can, can something good come out of the Old Testament? The answer is yes, okay. And Revelation chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes and where have they come from? I said to him, sir, you know. He said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So thank you for bringing uh, your illustration with uh, the blood of Christ there. Yeah, this is that robe. So now it's been stripped of Joseph. Wow, just as they stripped Jesus. Okay, can anyone strip you of your baptism? No. No. What an awesome thing to remember in the midst of great devastation. You could, they could strip you of your clothes. They cannot take away your baptism. Keep that in mind whenever we're facing major trials and tribulation. Again, where was Luther pointing you to before? I am baptized. I'm trusting and I've been absolved. I've received the body and blood of Christ. I have that firm word of God. Yeah, hang on to that baptism. Does it save you? Amen. It does. Okay, let's get back to Genesis. Or, or did I lose people along the way? Any major questions? I'm going to just pause for a moment because I really just tossed an awful lot at you. Okay, you're, you're humoring me. Okay, that's good. So, <laughs> verse 25. Then they sat down to eat. Oh, you love that. <laughs> hey, yeah, potluck time. Okay, we're hungry. We, we did our work. We threw our brother into the pit. Let's celebrate. Yeah. Time to eat. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way and carrying it down to Egypt. Hmm. Light bulb. Okay, but let's, uh, let me bring Luther in here. They sit down to eat bread as though they had carried off a successful transaction. Their conscience is secure and sin is asleep. But God attends to all matters in a wonderful manner. The wretched father sits at home not knowing how matters stand with his son. Nor does Joseph discern any ending to his misfortunes. God is the only one who sees, and he plays with the father and son in a very kindly manner. For it is a game full of divine mercy and goodness, very heavy and sad for us, but working in us an eternal weight of glory beyond measure. Okay, so Luther's saying, hey, uh, we're at this tension point here. But don't worry, this will all work out to God's glory. Ah, change in subject. Verse 26, then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. Man, his brothers listened to him. Ooh, Judah, what happens through the line of Judah? Christ, yes. the Savior, let's profit from this. Boy, does that bring any 
messages in the back of your mind. Mm. Let's well, jo um, Judas sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, and actually, did I bring that one in there? No, I brought in a different one, but that's okay. I also had that. I did have that in there, but I don't think I put that slide in there. Oh, yeah, I actually did. I'm sorry. Uh, that's actually in the next verse. So then I'll back up and pick up the hand washing here. Um, so let's just go to that Matthew chapter 26, verse 15. Uh, and said, uh, basically, uh, Judas is speaking, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? They paid him 30 pieces of silver. But now let's pick up the passage from Genesis chapter 37, verse 28. Then the Midi uh, Midianite traders passed by as they drew Joseph up, lifted him up out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. So, okay, is this inflation? <laughs> Before it was 20, now it's 30. Uh, or maybe they just realize, hey, just Jesus is not just quite a Joseph, but a little bit more. Eh, either way will work. Uh, but yeah, there was an exchange of money. Yes, Jeff. I, I understand in Jesus' case anyway, with the 30 pieces, that was the going rate for a price of a slave. You're right. So maybe at this time, it was 20. What's the going rate for a price of a slave? Actually, the scripture, actually, I was thinking of bringing that in there, but thank you for doing so off your memory, uh, is that uh, yeah, this was this, the going rate for a person. So now let's go back to the 20. They devalued Joseph. Uh, well, you're assuming that the pieces of silver and the shekel are the same weight. Sorry about that. Yeah, well, it was 20 shekels, uh, sh shekels of silver. Yeah. But, yeah. I understand. Yeah, the, the pieces, pieces of, of silver. Shekel. Right. The, Could the have pieces changed. were right. Roman pieces, Ro Roman coins, not the same as the shekel of, you know, two. Right. Of, of yeah, I, I don't want to get into, years. yeah, all the details of that. But, yeah, so I'm just having a little fun with the inflation. But I, I do have a, I will entertain a little bit of an idea his brothers were devaluating him. Yes. but. They, 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 still, they still wanted to make a, a profit. But let me back up one slide because I, I missed this one uh, to, buy, to bypass it. My, my first reaction when I was going through this verse was to pick up uh, Judah's concept of wanting to be innocent and declaring himself innocent of this man's blood. Was, was he really innocent of it? He didn't really kill Joseph, no, but we sold him off into slavery. Hmm. So I'm bringing up uh, from Matthew chapter 24, verse 27, verse 24. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water, washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And forever we hang on to Pilate's name and put him into the creed as being innocent, right? Uh, no. We name him into the creed as being guilty. Okay, and as the psalmist now brings up in a very interesting way, 26 verse 6, I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord. This is actually a positive washing of hands of innocence. So I want to beg the question, how do we in a positive way wash our hands in innocence, whereas Pilate did it in a negative way? The answer is faith. Faith saves you. Faith washes you clean. You've been baptized. You have that beautiful illustration of that cleansing water of baptism. Okay? And that's the difference. So I have two hand washings here in Scripture. One we look at negative and forever we embed into the creed for Christians to confess. Pilate thought he was washing his hands in innocence. The answer is no. But yet there is a positive washing. Welcome holy baptism by faith. Yes, the psalmist wasn't talking about uh, baptism per se, but it is a beautiful parallel to teach. By faith we are saved. And by faith we are innocent. Our sins are forgiven. Okay? Pilate and Judah are trying to avoid guilt.
Just like Reuben kind of struggled with this, uh, Judah is also struggling. Let me continue on. Okay. This is where I go back to the passage that I was talking about with earlier. Uh, uh, could they have gone back to dad? Okay. And consulted. Uh, let's bring in verse 29. When Reuben returns to the pit, so we don't know how much time has transpired. We don't know whether it, Reuben was probably not there when Joseph was sold. Where was Reuben? Hmm. We don't know. Uh, yeah, we're not going to go there. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and where shall I go? I really don't know why he says, where shall I go? Okay, but you get a very distraught disorientation of Reuben. And I'm going to bring it in as a parallel passage from Luke chapter 2, verse 48. And when his parents saw Jesus, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. Something has gone awry. Reuben was not in on the plan. Uh, they probably told him at that point. Uh, we sold him off, uh, and maybe he was trying to free Joseph, but was too late. We don't know, uh, but we do know he was in distress. That much we do know, okay? Uh, was he still trying to atone for his guilt, and he thought that redeeming Joseph would be his way, his ticket out of guilt, possibly, quite possibly, um, but uh, we don't know 100%, but it's a, a good thing to kind of entertain a little bit. But let's find out what they do with Joseph. Uh, then I should say Joseph's robe. Verse 31, And then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. They sent uh, the robe of many colors and brought it to their father. And they're now going to consult with the father. And said, "We have This we have found. Please identify whether... It is your son's robe or not. And he identified it and said, It is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn into pieces. So the, the sons allow the father to think what he wants to think, yeah. even though they have information to the contrary. This is, of course, part of Luther's explanation to the fourth commandment, right? Honor your father and mother? No. Uh, and again, uh, this is basically saying, yeah, the, his own children are deceiving him. Yes. Who wasn't in on it? Well, we don't know all of them were there because we're not too sure about Benjamin and others, but the key ones were there. Let's just put it that way. I'm going to bring in Luther for a moment. Luther writes, but of what kind is this mission? What is this idiom? To send a savior into Egypt to save Jacob and his whole house? How is he sent? He is thrown into a pit. He is sold. His father is killed. Is this sending a savior? It is, indeed, but in accordance with God's idiom. For he is appointed king. But God alone sees it. Jacob and Joseph do not see it in as much as they are involved in the greatest trouble and grief. This, then, is a special and heavenly language to send a savior and to appoint a king by hurling him into a pit and hell. So notice Luther bringing this back to Christ, okay? And he's, he's sort of begging the question, is this really man's plan of saving a people? Remember the dream that they would bow down to Joseph. Was this God's plan or Joseph's plan? How would humanity ever come up with a plan that says, I'm going to rule, and first of all, I'm going to allow my brothers to sell me into slavery, and then we'll find out what happens to him after he's into slavery. 
and how he's definitely wrestling with a lot of things, and then I'm going to rise to power. Man's plan is just slowly keep on gaining more and more power, not that depth into hell. This is obviously God's plan. Yes. And so how does God's plan of sending a Savior? Was Jesus born into a kingly family? No. Mary of humble estate, and then crucified, dies on the cross, okay? Everyone's expecting, you know, a royal family. And the answer is, the cross does not meet with the world's expectation, but it fulfills God's plan. And again, Joseph is a type or an illustration of Christ. Okay, yeah, Janet. What does it mean there when it says his father is killed? Oh, we're going to find out a little bit. That's the next slide, sorry. Luther's getting a little ahead of himself uh, in his notes. Uh, Luther will allow him that liberty. Uh, but thank you. I'll just turn into the next slide and we'll answer your question. Verse 34, then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. Okay, so... Keep in mind Jacob's reaction here. He's basically torn apart. And that's what Luther is kind of referring to. He's almost like kind of dying on the inside, okay? To the concept of saying, I'm going to be going down to Sheol, okay? I'm going to be with my son dead. So he's sort of describing that depression, that grief so much that he felt himself, so to speak, dead. And he could not be comforted. There was no comfort for him. I did not bring a, a parallel passage, I should have, um, of uh, David with uh, the death of uh, uh, his son from Bathsheba. He mourned uh, and, until uh, the, the son uh, died because of uh, the God's... Um, uh, statement to him through the prophet uh, Nathan. But let's uh, let me finish this up with Luther because then we have to kind of close. Uh, therefore, if our Lord God lets such experiences come upon his children, we should not murmur when things do not always turn out for us just as we want them to. If God lets his saints, whom he loves dearly, be so afflicted, then let us too bear it patiently. If at some time sad and adverse experiences fall to our lot, for these matters are not signs of wrath and of being forsaken, but rather proofs of grace for the testing of our faith. I should have highlighted that last line. So Luther wants to try to convince you that when something bad happens to you, it's not that God is forsaking you, but rather these are proofs of God's grace for you. Mm, at this point, we might want to throw a little two-year-old temper tantrum and say, no, I don't want this. Okay. But of course, Luther sees that even in the midst of devastation and adversity, <clears throat> a God who is faithful. I have been baptized. I've been absolved. I've been fed the body and blood of Christ. My sins are forgiven. I've been given God's holy word. Hang on to that faith. During the good times, and during the challenging times. John, I, I kind of really need to go here, but uh, quick question. It's not a question. I'm okay. just saying, John has given us two illustrations of, of humbleness. His humility is shown through 
Joseph and all this right now. There, there's lots of good teaching points for us as Christians in our daily life as we're going through this life of Joseph and going, wow, we should see ourselves, maybe not as uh, problematic as uh, Joseph is going through, but we should see our own suffering in the midst of this, but a loving, gracious Savior even in the midst of suffering. But let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.